All right, I can keep an eye on the numbers as people come in. If you're all logging in, welcome to Master Gardeners Presents. We'll be getting ready and we'll get started in a few minutes. We're going to give people time to log in. We have a lot of people interested in today's program, so <clears throat> there'll be a lot of you tonight. If you're not familiar with the Zoom, on the bottom of your screen, you're going to have like a chat. That's a good place to put in if you have any like technical questions, like if you can't see or something's going on. Um, and then we have a Q&A. You can put Q questions down there anytime. Uh, numbers are still climbing, so we'll... All right. Numbers are still climbing, so we'll give people a few minutes yet. We're going to be talking about container gardening today. The weather just calls for <laughs> planting, and maybe people have things they'll have to put in the containers. <laughs> you know, I think I'm getting my first sunburn of the year. But that's... <laughs> yeah. Par for the course. Well, numbers are still climbing, so I'm going to give people some time. With so many people interested, I want to make sure people can log in okay. Everyone's mowing their lawn tonight. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start getting started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Master Gardener Presents. I, my name is Jill. I work at the Kimberly Library. I'm also a Master Gardener with the Outagamie County Master Gardeners Association. And today I am here with Tom Wenzel, who has been a part That's of the me. Master Garden Association for many, many years, and he also plans this um, and gets us speakers every month. And today he's going to be our speaker, and he's going to talk about container gardening with you. So I'm excited to hear about this. When you no, you're gonna... ready, Tom. Okay. I, I love to do con containers. Uh, a few years ago in 2013, uh, I was on the garden walk. And uh, at that time I had 75 containers. I've pared things down a little bit and now I'm probably down to about 20 or 30. That may sound like a lot, but it really isn't. Now, what we've got on your screen now is a exercise in a PhD in container gardening. This thing is probably 15 feet tall by 50 feet across. And it is just an amazing garden. And when you talk about container gardening, the first thing that comes up is the, the container gardening mantra, thrillers, fillers, and spillers. You know, why are these the big things? This is determining how your eyes move through your garden and uh, through different flower arrangements. It's not just your garden, it's the overall landscape, your garden itself. 
and then an individual container. Now, this may be something that you hadn't expected to see, but you look at this, does anybody see thrillers, fillers, and spillers? They're all fairly obvious. You know, you got something that gives it some height, something that gives it some breadth, something that gives it some depth, and your eyes move through this whole thing. Now, we'll go back a little bit to the original container, if you want to call it that, and consider how your eyes move through the arrangement. This is what it's all about. You don't see any of the mantra in there, I hope not to uh, beat to death the mantra, but it is a reoccurring thing. But keep considering how the, your uh, containers and your garden is viewed, how your eyes move through it. Now, let's get back down to something a little more practical. Okay, here's a container. So we've gone from a, a mountain landscape to a um, huge container garden. Now we're down to a pot. Now look at how your eyes move through it. It's basically the same thing that you're, you saw in the landscape. You've got this tall thing in the back, you've got some interest in the middle and you've got some a uh, sweet potato vine drawing your eyes down. So there's a lot of movement within this container. And that's what you're trying to create with uh, doing landscaping. And landscaping and, and containers are just a tool to use in your landscape. They're not an end in themselves. And that's a point that I wanna make is that, yeah, you can have some spectacular containers like this, but that's not the end of it. That's just the start. Now, start when you're selecting plants. Let me back up a little bit. One of the most difficult things about putting together a presentation is what not to include. And because you know this this could go on forever. But and so I'm not going to talk a heck of a lot about selecting specific plants for a specific container. But I'd like to give you a feel for how to combine things. You look at the can of lilies there. That you know these the, the can is here. They've got some really spectacular flowers and they do very well in containers, but they're really the big thing is their foliage. And then you've got some contrasting color foliage in here and then some flowers down below. But the emphasis on here and here is not the flowering thing, it's the texture and uh, the color of the foliage that you're dealing with. And this plant down here, if you're not familiar with it, you are familiar with it, it's Creeping Jenny. And there's this yellow version that um, I bought several years ago and I planted it and I found out what it was and I'm still trying to get rid of it. Anyway, a more one of the more classic plants that you will see in the garden is this fountain grass. Gives you a lot of height. It's got some nice texture down here. And then the sweet potato vine in there, it gives you, your eyes move through this quite a bit. You know, my wife always criticizes me for saying this, but something I wanted to say at the start is that this is the last program of the year for the Kimberly Library, and we are looking for ideas for next year. And so if you have some programs that you would like us to do, 
please put them in the chat box. So anyway, back to the topic at hand. You know, when you're choosing plants for a container, you have to have stuff that likes the same uh, type of growing environment. They like the same kind of light, same moisture, and the same kind of soil. You put a succulent plant in with something like a papyrus, the two don't have anywhere near the same cultural uh, needs. So look at what you want to uh, grow, make sure that they are compatible with each other and try to mix plants within um, a container. Here you've got sweet potato vine, coleus, and I'm not sure what, this is one of Gail's containers. I'm not sure what she has in the top on there. So, but you look at the change in the colors through here. There's nothing flowered. All of these are basically shade plants. So they have the same requirement. And this is an initiated part of your garden. When you're looking at container gardening, one of the, the, well, the second thing, first thing you talk about is what kind of plants do I use? Second thing is what kind of container do I use? Well, that's where it gets to be really fun. You can do just about anything you want as long as it can hold soil and as long as it has good drainage. Uh, drainage is, is paramount in growing any potted plant, whether it's a host plant or a container in your garden, you must have good drainage. If you don't have that, you're going to have root rot. So to improve the drainage, obviously you have to have holes in the bottom of the pot, but then you want to cover it with a few inches of coarse gravel or some rocks or whatever, uh, so that the water can drain out uh, pretty freely. You can use just about anything you want. Uh, you can stretch your imagination. A lot of people have seen a uh, hen and chicks grown in boots, an old wheelbarrow, and I rather doubt that anyone out there has a truck that uh, they can spare to use as a container. But the point is, is that be creative. You know, just because it isn't a typical pot, that's okay. You can go ahead and use it as long as it has good drainage and uh, can hold soil. Speaking of soil, okay, here is you know sort of a dilemma. You think that well, you can you have uh, garden soil. My plants grow great in there. Why can't I use it in the pot? Well, it's much too dense. It doesn't have the aeration that is uh, needed for growing in a container. Consider that you are going to be planting a pot that's going to have a much higher uh, plant density than you would consider doing in your garden. So that's the reason that you have to do something special with that. So what the typical container soil is soilless mix, which is generally peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, bark, coir fiber, which is a substitute for peat, uh, coir fiber. You're starting to see it a little more often in this area, but it's ground coconut thing, uh, coconut hulls. And so you can use that. And yes, I do use my soil over from year to year. And as you all know, hunting soil is not dirt cheap. And that's a, sort of a driving 
force for me. Uh, well, don't you get weeds? Well, yeah, it's a garden. You got weeds, so you pull them out. You know, don't worry about it. But what you can do every year is uh, add back a little bit of compost if you have that available and uh, maybe up to 25%, certainly not over 25% of the compost. But I do reuse my soil. It's it's just a little practical, it's such a practical thing to do. The other thing you have to worry about shouldn't say worry about that you should consider is heat absorption. When you've got these nice pots, you know, like something like this, you put it in the sun, it's a dark pot, and it's going to absorb some heat uh, just because it's dark. And uh, that's going to cause some issues with your plants. So if you're growing something that requires a lot of moisture or uniform moisture, you have to consider what kind of a pot you're putting in. Uh, maybe use a white pot instead or grow a spiller that's going to provide some shade. Or in this case, plant something that can tolerate the heat and that can tolerate uh, drying out a little bit. So there are some plants that can, uh, herbs that grow very well in uh, warm conditions such as sage. They prefer the warm soil. You know, nobody, I don't think anybody's ever copyrighted a um, container design. So go ahead and steal some ideas, to get some inspiration from what others have done. You know, in a, a plot like this, there's quite an accumulation of uh, plants in there. You've got a flowering maple in here. And this looks like a rosemary or something, and different textures and whatnot. Borrow somebody else's ideas. And something like this, where you, if you have a stairway or something like that, go ahead and use those ideas uh, in your own gardens. Watering is critical. Um, these are containerized uh, uh, plants, and there's a limited amount of volume there. And you have to be aware of uh, how your plants are going to dry out and how often to water them. I'm always skeptical of people that's it. Well, I water my plants on Thursdays. Well, I mean, that's fine and dandy, but you may be overwatering some and underwatering others. So be a little more aware of what's going on in your garden and in your containers. And the needs are going to change as the plants mature. They're going to need more moisture than they were when they were first planted. Oh, uh, the time of the year, the, in July and August, yeah, you're going to have to water a little more and than you would in June or October, September, October. Is the container in a location that's susceptible to a lot of wind? And what type of container is it? I do use, uh, I do not use porous containers. Uh, I like the fiberglass, the plastic, glazed pots, but I stay away from the terracotta kind of pots uh, that evaporate a lot of moisture through the pot itself. 
One of the tricks that I like to use is a, 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 a skewer, a bamboo skewer that you would use in cooking. You can pick them up really cheap at any grocery store, stick it in the pot. When you don't know if the pot is ready for watering, pull the stick out, pull the skewer out. If it's wet, don't water it. If it's dry, water it. It's a really, a, it's, it seems so simple, but it's, it's not a technique that uh, people normally know about. You know, you do need to water before a problem exists. You know, if the plant is starting to wilt, you have to watch that. Uh, one of the things that you need to be aware of though, is that a plant that's overwatered and underwatered will often look the same. Or oh, you see a plant that's beginning to wilt, well, I have to water it. Well, the problem may have be may be that you've been overwatering, and the water in the soil is soggy, and the plants are uh, the roots have rotted. So, what happens when the roots rot? Plant above the ground doesn't get any water, and so it wilts. If you forget to water it and it dries out, guess what happens? The plant above the water wilts. The effect is the same. The causes are totally opposite. So keep that in mind. Uh, get used to the, if you've got some relatively small plants, get used to the weight of the plants. Go around and pick up the plant pick up the pot and you'll get a feel for how often it needs to be watered. The other thing is fertilizing. You know, we went way back to what the soil uh, content is. And basically there's essentially no or very little nutrient content in that. So you have to supply that. And a regular fertilizing program is really important to having a very robust container. There's a couple of ways of accomplishing this. You can use liquid fertilizers. Um, and those, it kind of depends on what your preference is. If you just have a few containers and you go out and you water them by hand uh, using a liquid fertilizer may be the best approach for you. Now you just go out and uh, boom booster, bloom booster is uh, one of the uh, fertilizers that's commonly used. You know, every week or two, put that on. But another alternative that I like to use is, is, is called the weekly, weekly approach. So you order, uh, you know, you fertilize every week, but with a weak solution. Your typical um, instructions for uh, liquid fertilizers every two weeks. So you cut the fertilizer in half and fertilize it twice as often. And that's something that I like to do. And periodically, you know, these liquid fertilizers do build up some salt. So periodically you would need to uh, just flush them out with some uh, plain water uh, to get rid of the salt. Salts on this uh, definition is a chemical definition, not a culinary definition.
definition, so it doesn't mean sodium chloride. Now, when you're watering plant, when you're first planting uh, your containers, I seriously recommend using a root stimulator. Um, Fertile Ohm is one that I use. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them out there. The other one I've got here is uh, Bonide. Oh, see, Steins has their own version. But basically, if you look at the Fertile Ohm thing here, it's four, 10, three. So phosphorus is a supporter of root growth. It also is illegible on here, but there's a hormone that uh, stimulates root growth. So I do seriously recommend using this when you're first uh, planting your containers. I also recommend, it's a little off topic, but using that when you're planting your garden in general, if you're putting tomatoes in the ground or petunias in the ground, whatever, start with putting in a root stimulator. Get those things off to a good start. The other approach, if you're not hand watering, if you're doing like me and you go run around with a hose, I like using granular fertilizer, specifically slow release. Now, these are uh, things you put them on like, and they say three months, that it'll last. Eh, a little more than that wouldn't be too bad. And the one I tend to use is Osmocote. Uh, there are organic fertilizers, uh, but go ahead and use these. They are slow release, which is uh, the best thing you can do. It's, you know, when you put on uh, fertilizers like the liquid fertilizers, it's pretty much, you know, the reason you put them on so frequently is because they leach out right away. And so you have to keep replenishing it. This is a, a continual supply of fertilizers. And you may wonder why using a flower and vegetable in here. If you have a container that's uh, strictly foliage plants, all coleus and sweet potato vine and that sort of thing, uh, a high nitrogen fertilizer might be okay. But if you got flowering plants, you want something that does not have a high nitrogen content. And what I mean by that is when you look at um, the fertilizer numbers on there, there's three numbers. The first one is nitrogen, second one is phosphorus. Yeah, let me back up a bit here. Okay, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen will give you a lot of green growth. Uh, potassium will give you a lot of root growth. Yeah, uh, phosphorus will give you a lot of root growth. Yeah. The potassium is for just sort of general plant health. So I go for something like this, which is like a triple 14, 14, 14, 14, a balanced fertilizer. Uh, so it, it covers all bases really. And when you consider uh, flowers and vegetables are both flowering plants to get a tomato, you have to have a flower, so it's a flowering plant. You go over to one of these uh, organics, you know, this is a 14, 14, 14, this may be a five, five, five. So you're gonna need more of this than you will of that to get the same uh, benefit. 
Now, plants are going to need some, or container, all plants are going to need some maintenance. And you're going to have to keep on that a little bit. And it's not something that uh, you need to do routinely when you're going around watering, take a look at your plants and see what's going on. Uh, if you've got some dead flowers on there, cut them off. I think she, you know, this is a gale slides. I think she sort of cheated a little bit. That looks a bit like a peony to me. So anyway, once the flower is done uh, blooming, cut off the spent blossoms. And if it's getting a little leggy, yeah, you know, cut it back a little bit. That uh, doesn't hurt the plant at all, It'll stimulate some new growth. And uh, one other thing it does is it improves your air circulation around the plant. So you have fewer issues with um, fungus and that sort of thing. One of the things that I really look for, particularly in petunias, is plants that do their own deadheading. You may have heard about wave petunias. Um, I had a really balk at using a petunia that isn't self-deadheading. They just turn out to be a lot of work because you have to be at them all the time in order to keep the plant healthy and bushy looking. You know, it's, it's like I've been talking about, go back and pinch off your, you know, here are the coleus are pinching off the flowers. Uh, the coleus flowers are fairly attractive, but uh, they, they can, once a plant goes to flower, it tends to get a bit leggy. So you want to keep that back, and you know, pinch it back, and that'll tend to encourage a little more uh, bushing out. Now we're going to move into a little bit of a different uh, tag here. We've gone through how to construct a plant, what eye movement is all about, fertilizing, watering, and pitching back and all that sort of thing. But the fun part of growing, of using containers is what you do with them. They're not an end in themselves. You go back to some of the original uh, photos that I had in the thing where they had these big spectacular uh, containers. If you got an entryway, that might be a great thing to do. Uh, but in the long run, you're gonna want something that adds interest to your landscape. You know, you look at this, all of that, this container here really augments the building in itself. And this is a very interesting. The other thing you can do is use plants to your advantage in uh, softening up things. Here's some ferns. Uh, you look at it, but without the ferns, yeah, okay, that's nice. But you put something like that and it softens up the lines a little bit. It just makes everything a little more friendly and uh, a little more inviting. Here's another situation. This is also in my garden. This is done uh, many years ago, back in the days when I was pushing 70 pots. My garden was not mature. And so what I did is I used pots I used containers to fill in gaps where my plants hadn't uh, matured yet. Now here's a shepherd's hook kind of thing with some pots in it. And I've got 
Jackson over here, but it adds a lot of dimension uh, that was missing with the uh, plants that were in the ground. Now this is a temporary effects. And as my garden has been evolving, my use of containers evolves also. So keep that in mind, but it is a great way to fill in some places where you have a, full, a hole that needs some attention. The other thing you can do is use containers to uh, create some movement in your garden. And you can do this by uh, creating some unity, something that makes your whole garden make some sense. And you can do that via um, using the same plant. And here in this example, I'm using a lot of impatience. So you've got impatience here in ceramic pots. And there's three ceramic pots here with white impatience in them. And they're all, you'll have to trust me on this, they're all similar pots. Move around here, you've got white impatience, the same impatience, but they're in an urn kind of pots. So you've got a little consistency there, you've got some unity. And here there's red impatience. Yeah, but I've used the same pot. So that creates some unity there and it's, it's, it's very pleasing to the eye, I thought. Here's another thing you can do. And the, these are three different pots, all very organic, very rock looking and that sort of thing. And so that in itself creates some unity. But there's also differences here. That one's a bird bath. That's a bird bath right there. But then you've got some succulents in here. But they go together because the pots are very similar. So again, that creates some unity. Now here's a contrast to that. Now here is a group of plants, group of pots, and you'd be hard pressed to find anything that's gonna unify these. Does that make it a bad collage? No, it depends on your per preference. It is a collage rather than a formal artwork kind of thing. So it, it depends on what you want to accomplish and what your tastes are. Uh, this is a street uh, vendor kind of thing. You know, it's a, it's, it's a business district. Uh, and so that's it's what they had to deal with. A little bit of a switch here again. And this is going back to variations on the thriller, filler, and spiller mantra. Okay, here's my coleus, which I obviously am not deadheaded. You don't think of ferns as a spiller, but here I'm using them as a spiller. Got sweet potato vines that are coming out of a hanging basket. I've got some marigolds in there and there's sweet potato vines over here and here. So there's a little in there. I've got marigolds in there too. So you've got a little bit of consistency between consistency between the containers to give them going back to the topic of unity, but also adding in some variety. And then I, I do like 
adding in some little sculpture kind of things too. This is a corner of my garage. And I like to do different things there. Now, here are three huge, and I mean huge pots. These things must go 20, 30 pounds by themselves. So when you plant them, uh, they're, they're pretty hefty. I got to move them around with a two-wheeled truck because they get extremely heavy. Plant here that I've got is called Elegant Feather. And I love this plant. It's, it's just sort of this lacy, ferny kind of thing. It gets to be like three feet tall. A uh, place that I, uh, where I get this is at a place called Green Handle. It's on in um, just north of where that big Nestle's plant is and south of uh, Van de Hees Landscaping. And so I've got a whole arrangement in itself with the classic mantra in this pot. But then I've got these two other pots that have viney nasturtiums that are spilling out of there. And then down here are some petunias, which typically would be a filler. But because of the physical location relative to these huge pots, it becomes a spiller. So be creative, plant one kind of plant in a pot and then arrange them. And as an aside, here's my peach tree. So I'm getting peaches out of this thing. The other thing about grouping pots like this, and I talk about having 20, 30 pots, Okay, here's, here's four of them right there. And when I water them, I can water a bunch of them at once. And if we go back to this, there's uh, four, six, nine plants there. And so I've got like 15 plants within a couple feet of each other and it makes water in the breeze. You drag the hose over and go for it. Okay, here is a different arrangement. Same location. But what I've done here is planted one, pot, one plant per pot, then arrange them in uh, by descending size to get the, uh, the, the movement that I'm looking for. Again, sweet potato vines, I've got the chartreuse one and then this and then the viola and, and then I've got a grass growing in what I call my porta potty planter. But, you know, a little aside here, you know, you look at these fiber lined pots, uh, which are really nice. They look really good. But what I do with these is I line them first with black plastic and punch a bunch of holes in it and uh, then fill it up with soil. And the reason that I do that is that without that black, without that plastic in there, the roots of the plant get down into the fiber. And then when you pull the plant out in the fall, you start to tear apart uh, your fiber mat. And these things are not cheap. And so it prolongs the life of these mats considerably. So your biggest problem from this point is birds getting in there and using them for nesting materials. 
Now, this is a, a, an arrangement that uh, my daughter put together, which I think is very nice. And this is, she said this is a purchased container here, which I believe she got out of uh, Honeymoon Acres. But we've got papyrus here and some petunias, and I'm not sure what, marigolds in there. And this has got all of the classic mantra in it. This is a container that she planted. So she's got the thrillers, fillers, and spillers here. But also you're looking at the difference in the plant height, you know, the pot height, and how you're creating something that creates, that has a lot of movement in it. And then she threw in this uh, iron sculpture thing, which again, creates a little variety and uh, extra movement into the entire arrangement. So group your plants together, group your pots together. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck. Now, this is an interesting one. I took these pictures several years ago at the Apple Valley Veterinary Clinic. It's on Northland Avenue. And the guy that, the vet, uh, I don't think, he, well, he doesn't work there anymore. He sold the business off, but he was a gardener. But look what he did here. This is amazing. He put and took two pots, similar, but he put one on top of the other. And then he planted them. And this is obviously, is in May. And then August, look how that, look how it looks now. So don't be afraid to experiment with something like this. You can group, again, you're grouping your pots together to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think this, this is absolutely amazing. I haven't uh, stopped by there lately to see what it's like, but, uh, Oh, this was amazing. Another uh, place to go, and if you've never been to uh, the garden door, uh, you're missing one of the best gardens in the state. Now you look at this, this is a picture frame. And there's a box behind, you know, it's basically a box. And then they put a picture frame on top of it. And uh, they planted from there. Absolutely amazing. And then they've got a complimentary thing here. So if you ever make a cherry run up to uh, Dora County, uh, this is a must see. If you don't know where it is, you will never find it. So go to the... Uh, how to give me uh, the Door County Master Gardeners website and uh, and look for the address. It's north of Sturgeon Bay. It's at the Agricultural Research Station. And once you find that, you're still not going to see it. There's a bunch of white buildings there, and you have to drive back behind that, and you'll see the garden door. And it is absolutely amazing. A couple of years ago, we did have a program on this garden. And uh, if you want to see it, it's been archived on the Kimberly Library website. And uh, you can go back and get a preview of that. So anyway, I love the garden door. Go there. See them where the specialist. Okay, this is a shot that we had earlier about something that didn't have unity. But here's kind of a contrast, and I think if I remember correctly, uh, this was on the road across the walk from this one, where they had something a little more traditional 
in terms of uh, the garden structure. So instead of looking at something where you have a round pot and the typical thing we've been seeing, here it's done horizontally and it works very well. The other thing you can do is use uh, pots in larger containers. And I, I can't remember actually where I saw this, and, but where you can switch out, these are individual little pots and, of seasonal flowers, and then you can rotate them through the season. And it's obviously in a larger pot. So you can do that sort of thing. And one of the nice things about that is you can change the look of your garden through the year, depending on uh, what the situation is. So I, I don't see this very often, and I think that's a shame, is hanging pots from trees. Now, look at, look at, look at this arrangement here. Doesn't that, uh, can you imagine that without the pots, this whole scene without pots in it? It's pretty plain Jane, but you add pots to it and it adds a whole new dimension to what you're doing. And if you look up here, this is another pot here and that's your typical spider plant. It's a house plant but hang it from a tree. The, it, the tree per, provides a dappled shade and these things will go absolutely bananas, you know, when they're in that sort of uh, condition. And here's some begonias in there also. So consider hanging things from trees. It will really be an eye grab. And one thing that people don't think of is bonsai. Well, it's, it's one of my other hangups. Uh, I'm into bonsai. And, but bonsai literally or figuratively translates the tree in a pot. So it's a container. Okay, now here's something where maybe I could use your help on because I don't grow uh, vegetables in containers. Uh, so I, what I do, what I'm presenting here is pretty much stuff from the book. Uh, I'm a little skeptical about growing lettuce greens uh, or salad greens in a container, be largely because it's short, so short term. If any of you ever grow lettuce, once it starts getting warm, they bolt and they don't taste so good at all. So it's something that's very short term. Maybe if you plant them in the shade on the north side, you might be able to get a few more weeks out of it. Uh, strawberries in containers. So if you've got some suggestions on growing uh, vegetables in containers, you know, put stuff in the chat box. One of the vegetables I would consider growing would be Swiss chard. And yeah, that's, it's a, it's a green that uh, tastes like spinach and it tolerates heat. So you can put it in your garden and you can grow it. Uh, the trick is to harvest the leaves when they're about this size, they get much bigger than that. They tend to get a little bitter, but you keep pulling off all the side leaves and that sort of thing. It's like there's some romaine here and then there's some basil up there. But if somebody's had more success, uh, uh, great uh, let me know. With that said, this is my daughter's basil plant, which she carried over from last year. 
you know, she's got a couple different uh, varieties in here. And this is, uh, you know, this patio door faces east and it doesn't get any direct sun during the winter. And it's amazingly how well it, it survives. So all of the rules in gardening are meant to be broken. This is one of them. So if you want to grow something in pots, uh, culinary vegetables, go for herbs. And you can hold them over into the next year, uh, given enough light, which is a topic for a whole new presentation. And oh, bring it back to now here's st stuff that I've seen, you know, when you're growing tomatoes, tomatoes need a lot of water. And if you're gonna grow containers in a garden, uh, be prepared to continue watering it. I've seen these topsy-turvy things. Um, I'm a little skeptical. I don't know anything about them. So if you've had any good luck on them or whatnot, uh, let me know. So that is basically the end of my presentation. If you have any gardening questions, or if you want to get involved in master gardening, there's a couple ways of getting a hold of us. You can contact us at ocmga.net, Outagamie County Master Gardeners. Uh, that's our website or gardener sos at outagamie.net. That's that's kind of our helpline, but basically you can uh, get to either one of them through the same through Outagamie Master Gardener. So we're all one great big happy family. Now my last presentation and the last slide here is uh, talking about what's coming up for master gardeners. Uh, like I mentioned that this is the last of the series uh, through the Kimberly uh, Library for this year. And as I said, please let me know if uh, you have any topics that you would uh, like us to cover next year. But following this is we're trying something new this year. And it's, if you haven't seen the uh, gardens, the Master Gardener Gardens, uh, it's, it's really an amazing place. It's across the street from Kitty Corner from Fleet Farm. And you can see the Fleet Farm gas station here. And there's going to be a series of four classes that are going to be held in the garden. And the one coming up on June 13th is going to be talking about roses and perennials. And here's the rose garden that's in there. And here are some of the perennials. And well, the difference here is this is not going to be a classroom situation. You're going to go out, you're going to be in the garden, and I get a chance to see what people are talking about in real life rather than a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, like I said, this is something that uh, we're trying uh, this year. This garden is available 24 7. Uh, if you're in the neighborhood, if you cross the street from Fleet Farm, the plant sale was held there. Take 15 minutes and take a walk through there. It is, it, it's quite amazing. So with that said, thank you. Are you ready for questions? So our first question here is um, with tall containers, there's a couple of people that have questions about this. Um, it would be very expensive to fill that all the way up with soil. And did you have any like suggestions to dummy it up, to fill it up with things other than soil? 
fill up the space in the container if you have a tall one? Well, I think a lot of it depends on how much. Uh, I assume what they're talking about is, you know, people don't know what peat moss is and coir and all that sort of thing. Is that the gist of it? Yeah. Anyway, it, a lot depends on uh, how many pots you have. If you've only got a few pots going out and buy a couple bags of uh, potting soil, you'd be very good to do that. Uh, I hope, hopefully that answers the question. I'm not sure okay. if it does. Um, let's see. I am a total newbie and would like some guidance on how to select containers, material drainage. I think you covered a lot of that. Um, let's see. <laughs> I've never, I've never worked with fertilizer. What would you recommend? Uh, there, there's two answers. That, well, I like uh, dry fertilizers and slow release. Um, and Osmocote, something. Just look for slow release. You know, Osmocote's a brand name. There's a bunch of lookalikes out there that are just as good. And... Um, use that uh, pretty regularly. Yeah, you know, it's like every couple months you throw a little bit out there. And I like using something that has a balanced uh, blend to it. Uh, the Osmo code I use is 14, 14, 14. If you're looking at the label, I would stay away from anything where the first number is larger than the other two and uh, you'll be fine with that as long as you do it regularly follow the label directions okay um let's see um and then somebody's asking if you have one specifically for strawberries like fertilizer i'm gonna have to uh default on that and going back to what i said that i don't uh, typically grow vegetables in pots. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna have to defer to the internet. And that's what I would have done is I go back and uh, look look something up, but it'd be book learning rather than any practical experience. So if you have any questions, send them to uh, the Gardner SOS and I can do some research if you'd like. Okay, there's a couple people that have questions about pests. Like they have squirrels that ruin all their pots or the bunnies get in there and they think like putting some barrier around it would take away from how it looks. Did you have any suggestions for keeping the pests out of your pots? There is a product that I've uh, used not in my pots, because typically they're too crowded for pests to get into, although I will find walnuts planted in my pots periodically. But there's a product called Cat Scat, which is basically a bed of nails. They're plastic and uh, they're little three quarter inch spikes. And so when they, and I, I've used them in my garden around tomato plants and that sort of thing. But that's what I would look for doing something like that. Uh, but basically my my containers are too crowded for animals to get in. But look look at cat scat. I think I got mine from Gardener Supply, but I imagine you could uh, get it from other locations. Okay, only have somebody that the answer on the strawberries, they said to just use 10, 10, 10. So if you yeah. so that would be great. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a couple of watering questions. Like somebody asked if you should use moisture crystals or granules to keep it more, and what to do if, if you have to go on vacation and you won't be able to water. The the moisture uh, soil moist, I think, is one of the brand names and that sort of thing. You know, I've talked to several master gardeners and some people swear by it, some people doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. I think it depends on your watering 
habits. If you are uh, in the uh, routine of checking your plans regularly and that sort of thing, it's not going to be that much of benefit. If you're like me and you sort of like maybe forget sometimes, maybe kind of, it, it would be more of a benefit there. What I do if I'm going on vacation with my containers is there's a couple of approaches, move them into the garage or and or group them together. And so that you're creating a little microclimate where there's a higher humidity in that area. So they're going to uh, be less likely to dry out. Kind of depends obviously on how long you're going to be gone. Uh, if you're going to be gone for uh, two, three weeks, I would look at moving things into the garage or onto the north side of the house, certainly out of the wind. Okay, so Zachary's wondering if there's any way to know if you are overwatering versus underwatering. I have a wilting plant and can't seem to tell if it is because I'm overdoing it or underdoing it. I'll go back to my suggestion of using a uh, bamboo skewer and stick that in there and wait until it's dry. The other thing that I tend to rely on is and it's practical only for relatively moderate sized pots, pick it up. <laughs> if it's heavy, it's probably overwatered. If it's light, it's probably underwatered. So get used to your plants a little bit and the weight of the pot. Uh, hopefully you've got good drainage and uh, without good drainage, all bets are off. But the bamboo skewer, skewer trick and uh, the weight of the pot are your best judges. Okay. Um, someone had a suggestion for the big pots to have a used pool needle, have pool noodles in the bottom for to take up some what? space. Pool noodles, <laughs> you know, those big noodles that you float on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, putting yeah. those in the bottom of the pots to make them not so yeah. heavy. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I've never heard that one, but that would be a good idea. The other thing I do is I take a milk carton, empty milk carton, stick it in there, uh, flower pots, turn them upside down and put them in there. Um, I've had somebody criticize me for that, saying these plants need as much soil volume as they can get. And well, yeah, you have to sort of balance things. But there's that's a wonderful trick. I love that. Let's see. Someone asked, what about like in the bottom of the pot you put gravel in? What if you put mulch there? Uh, I would not put mulch down there because that's going to retain too much moisture and it might inhibit drainage. So when you're getting down into the bottom of the pot, uh, drainage is, is critical. Um, someone else is asking how you put osmicote, os osmicote, is that? Osmicote. Yeah, how do you put it on? Uh, you just sprinkle it, uh, sprinkle it on according to the label directions and then scratch it in maybe a half inch down. It's quite simple. All right. Um, I think that's all of our questions. If anyone has any other questions, you can shoot Tom at Gardener SOS. Mary Lou, do you have any suggestions on uh, vegetable questions? You're more of a vegetable gardener than I am. Well, I think that uh, your response about the lettuce is very true because lettuce is not a very long lived plant and I don't think the pot would look very good for very long. But if you're wanting to grow things in pots, not necessarily to be pretty, but to use them, um, 
that's something that people do, especially that have uh, patios and balconies. Uh, you can grow radishes, you can grow carrots, as long as the depth of the soil is deep enough to handle it, but they're not going to necessarily be pretty um, unless you would combine them with, uh, with some flowers. But I have not, I've grown things in pots and I've had very large pots and I have found that tomatoes, unless you get the little cherry tomatoes, the little patio tomatoes, um, I have found that they don't produce well. They grow well, the plant does, but they don't have very many tomatoes on it. And I find that the, you know, growing them in the ground is uh, much better for production of tomatoes. You're but better you... off going to the farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I think, you know, if you get the determinant, small cherry tomatoes and ones that are, you know, for the patio and that, you will be more successful than getting like the larger tomatoes. All right. Someone's asking in a raised garden bed, how deep should dirt be for lettuce and onions? I don't think you need to be very deep for lettuce. Could you repeat that, please? <clears throat> in a raised garden bed, how deep should the dirt be for lettuce or onions? Well, and, and typically, um, I would look at six, eight inches. Lettuce and onions have totally different nutritional needs. Lettuce likes a lot of nitrogen. It's a leafy plant. If you give onions a lot of nitrogen, you won't get any bones. Mm. So don't plant them near each other. They're not friends. All right. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for joining us. This was really informative and great. Um, I learned something for sure. Um, and I think everyone else did too. So I'm going to close out this session. Thank you everybody for coming. And um, we'll see you at the Master Gardener building in summer. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.